He came to my office and said, Pastor, I don't know that I can believe anymore. And it scared him. It's the first time in his life that he ever experienced doubt to the point of saying, I don't know that I can believe in Jesus anymore. What changed? Recently, he watched as a loved one suffered from cancer and eventually passed away after a long battle against it. And through it all, he wrestled with, God, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why are you allowing him to suffer? And he wrestled with it as doubts creeped in. And he got to the point where he said, I just don't know that I can believe anymore as the doubts were overtaking his faith. Have you experienced doubts in your Christian walk? It can happen in the blink of an eye and it can happen from all kinds of different things uh, that we experience. In middle school and high school, you have friends that aren't Christian and they do things and say things and watch things and participate in things that are contrary to what the Christian life is all about and they don't really seem to have any consequence. And so do I really have to follow? Is, is the Christian life and what the Bible says actually true because there's no consequence for them and it seems to be okay? Doubts creep in. You look at the scientific community and, and you have friends who are into science and, and, uh, and they say, look at the facts and the facts just, they contradict what scripture says and so can you really be sure? And you look at the facts and they seem to be legit and doubt creeps in. You stand like this man at the bedside of a loved one and all of a sudden you're confronted with finality. Is there life after death? Is what I believe actually true? Is Jesus real? Is heaven even real? As it starts to creep in, all of those doubts. Maybe you have a, a bad relationship with a church in the past. You, you, you trusted a church, you trusted a tr church staff, and they lied to you, they deceived you, they took advantage of you. And, and now the institution has really changed the way you view the Bible and Jesus and is it really true? You're not sure. Or maybe you doubt in a completely different way. Maybe the doubts that creep in for you are doubts like this. I'm talented. I've built my business from the ground up. I work hard. Do I really need and rely on Jesus? Because I've seemed to provide for myself my whole life. Do, do I really need this Jesus guy? What do we do with our doubts? Maybe a better question, and, and maybe one that we need to address is, how does Jesus handle a doubter? Thankfully for us, we get to look at Jesus' encounter doubt in Mark chapter 9, uh, and that's where we're at today. Let me give you the background real quick. Mark chapter 9 starts with the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus and his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, go up on a mountain where Jesus is transfigured. He's changed into his heavenly glory. His body changes. He's glowing like the sun. His, his clothes are whiter than uh, bleach could ever bleach them. And Moses and Elijah appear in, in their glory, in the heavenly glory as well. Uh, and they lived hundreds of years before Jesus. After that event, Jesus and his three disciples come down the mountain and they encounter this argument happening at the base of the mountain. Here's what we see. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. The man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. 
So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into a fire or, or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. Let's stop right there. Can you picture the scene as Jesus comes down the mountain? There's this whole crowd at the base and as there's all this arguing and commotion, as Jesus comes down, everyone sees him and Jesus being year three into his ministry is kind of a superstar at this point and they see him and they all come rushing towards him. And Jesus says, what's everyone arguing about? And the man, the father, approaches Jesus and says, teacher, my boy is possessed by a, an evil spirit, a demon. He's mute, he's deaf, and it throws him into convulsions where he foams at the mouth. And it throws him into the fire. It's tried to throw him into the water to kill him. I brought him to you, but you weren't here and your disciples couldn't drive him out. Can you imagine what that father must be feeling? Imagine living with that every single day. The worry that fills your heart. The constant attention that your boy needs because it doesn't just stop in the middle of the night. These, these convulsions, these, the, the, the evil spirit seizes him up even in the middle of the night. It's not like, okay, he's in bed. We can breathe for the next eight hours. The fear, the worry, the hopelessness. Will this ever end? And then you hear of the healer, Jesus. And you bring your boy to, to him, and he's not there, but his disciples say, well, we can do it. But they couldn't. And so all this hope becomes hopeless again. And now he's standing before Jesus. And notice what he says. If you can help us, take pity on us, and heal it. And you catch how Jesus responded. If? If I can? <laughs> well, everything's possible for the one who believes. Why? Because Jesus has immeasurably more power than anything we can ask or imagine. Which is pretty big. That's what the book of Ephesians says. That, that is huge. We can imagine so many things. We can imagine so much power. And Jesus says, I can do immeasurably more than that. And through faith in him, through trust in Jesus, we have access to all of his power. And so he says, if, come on, if, everything's possible for the one who believes. And notice what the man says. I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I believe. But Jesus, I'm doubting. I believe. But I've had my hopes up too many times to fall for this again, Jesus. I believe. But can you really? Notice what he doesn't do. The man doesn't say, oh man, everything's possible for the one who believes. Oof, I really need to go away and think about this. I need to really consider if I believe in you, Jesus. I need to, I shouldn't have folded my arms. I need to really think and dig in and research. I need to talk with my friends. I need to, I need to really consider, do I believe in you, Jesus? Because everything is possible for the one who believes. I need to go and think. No, where's he go? Jesus. He brings even his doubts to the Lord. Why? It's your first point today. Because Jesus alone delivers us from doubts. And that's why I love this section of scripture so much. Because it's so relatable, isn't it? Who hasn't had doubts in their Christian walk like this man? I believe, 
help me overcome my unbelief. And where does the man go? He goes to Jesus. And what I love about him is he doesn't fake it. He doesn't pretend. He doesn't pretend that he has a stronger faith than he does. No, he, he comes to Jesus as he is and says, this is where I'm at. I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. There's no pretending. My daughter is, is big into pretend right now, and for some reason what she likes to pretend is that uh, I'm her husband and she's sick and I have to take care of her. I don't know why. <laughs> This isn't like a big thing in my household that like she, you know, emulates and sees on a regular basis and doesn't get sick that much, but that's what she wants to play. So she does a pretty good job of pretending to be sick, <laughs> but it's all pretend. Do you ever feel like you're pretending in your Christian life? Do you ever feel like when you come here today, this morning, do you feel like you're faking just how much faith you have? You, you put on that mask, so to speak, to look stronger than you are, to look like your trust is firmer than it is. This man didn't. He took his unbelief, he took his doubt to Jesus and said, I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And where should we go with our doubts? To the Lord. Because how does, how does the Lord receive a doubter? He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't make him feel small. He doesn't belittle him. He doesn't say, you know what, you need to really go and think if this is something that you want. You need to really decide if you believe in me. No. He simply speaks truth with love. If you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. And this is how our Savior receives us. I love how Isaiah 42 says it. Uh, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah prophesied regarding Jesus that a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Amen. Have you seen a smoldering wick? You burn a candle, and, and that flame is nice and big, and then as the candle's getting ready to go out, that wick just has that little tiny flame. It's, it, it's very, very small. Have you ever felt that way in your faith? Jesus says, if you come to him when you're like that, he's not going to snuff you out. He's not going to break you when you're bruised. Instead, what does he want to do? He wants to come with his truth, with his grace, with his mercy, and fan the flame of your faith back up. He's not going to snuff you out. He's going to bring his word, and he's going to ignite your faith once again as he takes you from doubt to trust. How does he do it? Well, for this man, he healed his son and drove out the demon. How does he do it for you and me? Maybe not as immediately, but what does he do? He comes with his word. He comes with his promises of grace and truth. He comes and confronts our doubts, but comes with mercy and grace, and his promises, his word refuses to let us go. He comes as we're doubting, and we come to him, he wrestles with us in our doubts, and he brings his promise after promise after promise, and slowly but surely chips away at our doubts until he brings us from doubt to trust and that's what he experienced he left my office that day saying I don't know if I can believe in this anymore wrestle with the Lord go to him in prayer bring your doubts to him be in his word wrestle with him and over the course of several months the Lord chipped away chipped away with his promises confronted his doubts and brought him from doubt to trust and that's where he's at today. And that's where you and I get to as we wrestle with the Lord, with our doubts. That's where the man, the father, got to as he wrestled with the Lord with doubts. Because where do we go with our doubts? We go to the Lord. And how does the Lord receive us? With grace, with mercy. He fans our flame back up. He takes the bruise and he heals it. And he brings us from doubt to trust once again as we rely on him. Now, if this is where this story ended, it'd be great. But there's one more aspect here. The next few verses. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out 
by prayer? It was a good question. Why couldn't they? This is year three of Jesus' ministry. Towards the end of year one, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two to preach the kingdom, and and he gave them authority to drive out demons. And so what had they been doing? They'd been casting out demons. They'd been driving them out. And so the disciples are a little confused. Jesus, why couldn't we do this? This kind can only come out with prayer. Commentators say there's two things happening. Number one, the first thing is it's possible that certain demons get driven out certain ways. But more likely is the option number two. The disciples became self-reliant. We've done this before. We've done this. And instead of going to Jesus in prayer and relying on him for the power to drive out demons, they said, we've done it. Look at our gifts. Look at our talents. We know what to do. Bring the boy to us and we'll drive out the evil spirit. You see, the disciples should have said the same exact prayer that the father did. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. The father doubted Jesus' ability. The disciples doubted they needed Jesus' ability. It's the same thing, just the other side of the coin. They were doubting Jesus. Have you been there? You've got gifts, talents, abilities. You've been through situations in life. You've seen a lot of things in life. You know how to deal with things. And pretty soon, we stop praying, asking for wisdom. Pretty soon we stop asking for guidance. Pretty soon we stop asking for Jesus' help because we've got it. We, we go through temptation. And as we're going through a, a season of temptation, we're praying, we're praying, Jesus, help me, deliver me, deliver me. And he does. And we stop struggling with it. And guess what happens as soon as we stop struggling? We stop relying on Jesus. And the prayer life lessens. Because that's how self-reliance is seen. Our our reliance on Jesus dwindles, and we show it by a lack of prayer life in our day-to-day life. How does Jesus handle that kind of doubter? How does Jesus handle the self-reliant who forget that they rely on him for power? What happened to the disciples? He lets them fail. Imagine being the disciples in that moment. You've got this huge crowd around you. You've got this dad who's, who's desperate, looking for hope, looking for deliverance. You've got the teachers of the law who are looking for some reason to accuse Jesus. You've got this huge crowd. And you say, well, Jesus isn't here, but I can drive out the demon. And then you can't. Imagine the embarrassment as you fail. Imagine the shame. Imagine the confusion. Imagine seeing the dad's face go from hopeful to completely shocked, confused, and hopeless again, and disappointed. How does Jesus lovingly handle someone who doubts him that way? He lets us fail. Sometimes in love, Jesus allows the self-reliant to fall. Why? So that they get to the point where the disciples are. Jesus, we need you. So we learn the lesson that we are completely reliant on the Lord. Now, why would he want us to do that? (laughs) Why would Jesus, why does he want us so badly to rely on him? I mean, if we're honest, uh, does it seem like Jesus has a bit of an ego problem here? If you're a skeptic, you look at Jesus and say, man, why are you like that, that you so desperately need people to rely on you? No, he doesn't have a big ego. Jesus loves us too much to let us be self-reliant. Because what do we see with the disciples here? They couldn't stand against the forces of evil. They couldn't stand against a demon. They had no power to drive him out on their own. And Jesus knows there's something even greater that stands against us. The forces of evil of demons, the devil, and hell itself. And on our own, we cannot stand at all against it. It's only through Jesus that we have the hope of eternal life. And Jesus, (laughs) 
How much power does he have? He simply speaks and this demon is gone. What the, what the disciples tried so hard to do, they couldn't do. And Jesus comes and what does he do? He simply says, get out, go. And the, and the demon leaves. And Jesus says, never enter him again. And he has no choice. He can't come back into the boy. And yet, what did, Jesus, what did it take for Jesus to deliver us from sin, death, and the devil? It didn't just take a word. It took all of his power to lay down his life. It took all of his power to shed his blood on the cross, to rise from the dead. It took all of his power to deliver us from death. And he did it because he loves us that much. Why does Jesus want us to rely on him? Your last point. Because it's only through Jesus that we are delivered from evil. Jesus alone can deliver us from evil. That's what we learn here. The only way that you and I can be delivered from sin is not by relying on ourselves, but relying on Jesus. The only way that you and I can be delivered from hell is not to rely on ourselves, but Jesus. The only way that you and I can be delivered from death is to not rely on ourselves, but on Jesus. And Jesus will do whatever it takes to continue to have us rely on him. He will either come with his promises and build us up so that our faith is strong, or he'll let us fail so that we are completely reliant on him, trusting him and him alone. Because what does Jesus want? In the end, he wants to do what he did for this boy. He wants to reach down and take us by the hand and pull us up so we may have life. Amen. For this boy, he reached down and pulled him up and gave him back to his father. What Jesus wants to do at the end of the world is reach down into your grave and take you by the hand and pull you up and stand you before the father and say, take him. He's yours. And we will live forever. Only Jesus has that power. And this is why he wants you to trust him. This is why he wants you to rely on him. And he'll do whatever it takes to do that. He will patiently come with his promises and build us up. He will patiently, lovingly let us fail to come walk with us and say, this one can only be driven out by prayer as he continues to build us up so that we rely on him. And so what do we do from here? Every morning, let's wake up and start with prayer. Let's take our doubts, whatever we're doubting, let's take it to the Lord and wrestle with him because he'll bring his promises and chip away at that doubt so we trust in him. Let's get up and start with prayer, relying on the Lord, thanking him for what he's given us, the gifts, the abilities, everything that he's given. Let's rely on him because it's only through relying on him that we have life eternal. And so let's rely on the Lord who has compassion and pity on us, who has his power for you and for me. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we, we praise and thank you for your patience, for your love. We thank you that you will not let us go uh, either in our doubt or self-reliance. Uh, like the Father, like the disciples, uh, we come to you and say, Lord, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Help us overcome our doubts. Help us overcome our self-reliance so that we rely on you, the one who has power uh, to free us from our sin, the one who has power to raise us from the dead, the one who has power to reach into our grave and stand us before the Father where we will live forever. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for your pity on us. We ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit into our hearts uh, to strengthen our faith. As we hear your promises, uh, help us to wrestle with them. Uh, we thank you that you receive us with grace and mercy, and you will do whatever it takes to strengthen our faith. And so we ask you to do that today. We ask you to build us up, uh, knowing that when we rely on you, we'll never be put to shame. It's in your name we pray. Amen.